Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to continue with part two of our gameplay demonstration from Hill of Doves, the solitaire war game from Legion War Games about the first Anglo-Boer War. Now in episode one, we talked about the overall structure of the game and we started in on week one. Today comes the fun stuff column formation, and assaults. We ended the previous episode at the end of day two, Tuesday, and General Colley and all his British forces that we can see in this British camp holding box in the bottom right-hand corner had arrived at the British map, at the British camp. Now, as we head into our third day, their objective is simple and straightforward. In order to win the war, the British forces have to capture and control all additional nine objectives that we can see on this tactical board. So our mission for this week, for the remainder of this episode, is can General Colley and these forces gain at least one of these objectives? As we did with the previous turn, as we did with every day, we're going to work through the objective uh, deck in order to lead us through this day. So start the day segment says advance the time marker. So we are done with that. The next thing that we need to do is to roll on the weather. Now we're in kind of a precarious position here because it's rained for two straight days. If it rains again, we'll go to deep mud and that has some consequences for us. So we're hoping for a one, two or three here. Uh, we get a four. So we advance the track to deep mud three consecutive days of rain. And deep mud has an additional consequence. Let's slide down here on the operational board and take a look at the double drifts marker here. Right now, this is listed as shallow, but because we're in deep mud, this has flooded. This has consequences because it means troops can't pass this until this flood breaks. So we do not want uh, any more rain because we actually want to send some of our troops back down to the camp at Fort Amiel so we don't have to feed them out of our rations up at the tactical map. So we're hoping that the rain breaks in one of our subsequent days. This, uh, this could, could potentially create problems for us. In our previous episode, we went through all the cards even if they didn't apply. This time, I'm just going to skip over the cards that don't apply to us. I'm gonna go right to the ones that do. We're skipping over three and four and going to number five, day assault segment. So if any assaults are to be resolved, we're going to move to the tactical card deck and resolve them. And yes, we have forces up at the British camp right now, so we want to launch an assault on one of these positions and get started to winning this war. Alrighty, so we have a tactical deck here that consists of 20 cards that's going to guide us through this assault segment. We're going to see how we learn, we're going to learn how to attack a, a, a boar objective with our British forces. The first thing that we have to do, it says, assemble tactical column segment. Place tactical columns in the British camp hex. So we have to assemble a tactical column. Now in the previous episode, we just kind of brought all of our troops and just lumped them into one big column and didn't really talk about any of the restrictions or rules that apply to that. But in this episode, we're actually going to talk a little bit about that because the rules and kind of restrictions in forming columns is kind of imperative to understanding in order to be able to successfully play the game. So let's take a moment now and we're going to basically break down what the rules and restrictions are for forming columns in the game. Alrighty, so we're going to form a column to put it in the British camp and let's talk a little bit about some of the rules and restrictions that apply here. For all intents and purposes, there are three different types. We can classify units as three different types for the purposes of assembling these tactical or operational columns. The rules are the same. We have leaders, which can either be an individual general or a regimental headquarter. And there's some differences that there are different capacities that you can use in formations depending upon which one of these is in charge of the column. We'll come back to that. The second type of unit that's important are these uh, infantry companies. We can see by their NATO designation, here we have two from the 360th and one from the 58th that are here. These are the kind of the core units, if you would, that form up the main component of, an inf of one of our tactical or operational columns. Now, anything else, uh, essentially cavalry, as we can see here by their NATO designations, or guns, which we can see here by cavalry designations because they're horse-drawn. They can lose that capacity, by the way. And there are four different types for guns. There are mountain guns, field guns, and then also not shown here, we have a section of Gatling guns or rocket tubes that come into play later. But for right now, we have these mountain guns and field guns. But for, for, cav for, for column formation purposes, Field guns and these cavalry, regardless of their color and their unit designations, are all considered reserves. And that's important because these can get added pretty much to any tactical column. However, there's one important constraint. You can't have more than a two to one ratio of reserves to infantry companies. So for example, 
say we were going to do this, we're going to send the 360th headquarters out, we could not send this 360th out with two infantry columns and six reserves, because that would be a three to one ratio. We'd have to cut down the reserves, perhaps bringing off these two additional ones, these two reserves. We could have these three cavalry units and this, this mountain gun. That would give us a two to one ratio. That column's a legal column. Now, the other thing to note is there's restrictions based on it. these regimental headquarters are relatively restricted. You can't really cross the streams, if you would, and kind of have uh, regiments from the 360th and the 58th if they're under the guidance of regimental headquarters. You can't mix and match these and can't blend these together. However, there is a way you can do that. If a general is present, you can kind of lump these all together. But so then the next question is, okay, we're going to pick an assault. What are we going to, what objective are we going to go for? And what kind of column are we going to build? So I'm going to come back, I'm going to build the column, and then I'm going to talk about why I'm doing it the way I did it. So first, before we talk about our column, let's talk about which target we're going to pick. Now, we can't pick a target that we would have to proceed through one of these triangular, see these yellow triangles are kind of pointing at these hexes. If we can't get to the objective without going through one of these type of triangular squares, so we can't attack there yet. So Majuba Mountain, we cannot attack yet because we can't, that's a guarded hex with a triangle, that's a guarded hex from the slopes, this is a guarded hex from Lang's farm, so we can't reach that, so we can't pick that one. We're gonna start this, and this I think is where the tactical uh, thinking behind the game that I'm not quite sure of yet, not having played it enough to know, but just for the sake of starting us off, we're going to attack Lang's farm here, which O'Neill's farm, sorry, which is close to our British camp, and it should be a relatively straightforward target to take given our capacities right now with the units that we have. So we're going to attack O'Neill's farm, that's our objective, and now let's talk a little bit about the column that we've put together. Alrighty, so here are the British soldiers that are going to lead our first attack of the war. We're taking the regimental headquarters for the 360th and all of their five infantry companies, because we want to overwhelm this position with strength. We're going to take five reserves with us, three cavalry reserves, and then our two field gun units. Now you might be saying, we have another mountain gun unit? You might say, well, why aren't we taking that one? We're not taking that one because we only have two case shot ammunition counters two case shot ammunition strength at our current supplies in the next. So we can only have, and they, these guns use case shot ammunition. So we don't have three, so there's no sense in us bringing that third unit. So we're just gonna take these two. Now you might be saying, well, why aren't you bringing General Colley? Well, here's the thing. General Colley is kind of incompetent. He takes a lot of historical blame for losing the war. And the formation that we use when we attack can have a significant effect on the amount of firepower that's going to be used against us. So you have three different types of formation, either mass, line, and extended. When we're attacking the farm, we want to be spread out in this extended farm, extended formation, and the, actually this 360th headquarters unit gives us a die roll modifier that makes it more likely we're going to be an extended formation. That's good. Kali Conversely, if he were in charge of this column, gives us a negative die roll modifier. He tends to cluster all the troops together and keep them all close together, which is going to make it more likely that we're going to get a negative impact on our assault. So we actually want to keep Kali out because he's kind of incompetent. He is useful, however, for shuttling troops back and forth because we can mix the regiments, as we mentioned. So we're going to kind of He's going to kind of be a ferryman for us for a while. <laughs> Sorry, Collie, but we just don't want you leading the troops in battle. So here is our forces that we're going to do, uh, are going to launch our first assault. All right, so getting us back to the card here, we've placed our tactical column, led by the 360th headquarters unit, uh, in the British camp. Now, we could have two columns attacking, and there are actually benefits to this, and there's a whole sequence that you go through if you launch two assaults in the same segment basically where you move them up and if their attacks overlap time-wise then you actually get a little bit reduced enemy uh, troops that are at that target but we don't have a lot of ammunition up here and so we're going to kind of just launch one assault right now and not go through that procedure but we're not we're not restricted to one assault here we could launch two so we've got our tactical column in the british camp and we've followed the rules to to, to basically build it we've chosen our objective which is o'neill's uh, um, 
Chosen on Icarus is basically O'Neill's farm up here. The next thing we have to determine is to roll on the assault formation table here to determine what formation we have got for this battle. Now, you'll notice that a 0 to 2 result is a mass formation, 3 to 4 is a line, and a 5 plus is extended. And we want to be in an extended formation. Kali would give us a minus 1, so that's not good, and that's why he's not coming. Um, now, the headquarters for the 260th or the 360th gives us a plus 1, and that's why we brought them, because we're hoping we get an extended column. So let's roll on this, and we're hoping for a 4-5 or a 6 here. We got a 6. Excellent. So we are in extended formation. That is huge. So now, over here on the right side of the board, we have these little orders counters. We're going to grab the one for the 360th, which is in charge, and it's in extended formation. And we're going to drop it right here beside O'Neill's farm in any one of these target segments. So that gives us our formation, which is extended. Our troops are ready to go. Very fortunate to get the extended formation. That's going to help us a lot as we see when we start to calculate the battle. So now it's time for card number two. We're through card number one. Number two says tactical movement segment. If only, but notice the beginning. If only one assault, place the tactical column directly into the rifle fire hex. So we just lift up this whole column and we drop it right into that hex where our orders are. You only use this tactical movement on the board if you have two assaults trying to launch simultaneously, in which case you follow the lower instructions in the half of this and you have these uh, two assault columns, tactical columns, basically move their way forward and you're hoping to get them to not run out of time and to get them overlapped so you'll have a little bit of a strength advantage when you attack. But we only got one going so we don't have to go through that procedure right now. Uh, card number three says, uh, is the bombardment segment, it says place bombardment markers showing target in any eligible objectives being assaulted. Our artillery is out of range, however. A bombardment can be very strong, but it has, a, it has a relatively limited range. I think it's three or four hexes. I'll have to check that. But um, it's, it's relatively short. We obviously don't have any. The British camp is just too far away, so we can't bombard anything with our artillery. And so that is drawn away, and we don't have to do anything with that. So the next thing is the commando strength segment. So this is where we calculate what the strength, of the enemy strength is going to be at this objective. And what the cool thing about the game is you never quite know what the strength is going to be at an objective until you get there. There's a lot of variables that come into play. And we're going to kind of learn about those now. But to do that, basically, we're going to kind of work our way from top to bottom through this card and apply each thing as we go. And there's a couple of unique situations. We'll see that if we get some of those. And what I've got off to the side here now, I'm going to pull it in, is this cup that has all of these little boar commando counters in it. And we pick from these, determine how many they are, and there's different types and different strengths and all kinds of different things can happen. So there's quite a bit of variability as to what kind of units are going to show up. So let's go through for the first part and figure out what the strength is going to be. First of all, we have to look at what type of objective we're attacking. Is it a main position? Is it an outpost? Or is it a farm? And the way you tell that is by the designation on the board here. A square is a farm, a triangle is a, an outpost, and then a main position has a star on it. We're attacking a farm. We can tell that by the square, and we can also tell, of course, by the name O'Neill's farm. So at a farm, there's a, we only have a minimum of zero counters. So we're not going to pick any counters for the farm. However, the next thing that we get for is plus one counter for each company assaulting a main position. A main position is one of the ones with the stars. We are not assaulting that, so we don't have to add plus one boar counter, enemy strength counter, because we're not doing that. When I first started playing, I made a mistake here. I thought that uh, any, any objective was a main position, but it's not. Um, it's only the, the strong points there, only those main positions there are the ones that you draw these counters for. So we don't have to pick any for that. However, here's where the fun part comes. We're going to draw plus one enemy counter for each supporting objective. And a supporting objective basically means any objective that has that is currently bore controlled, and we'll slide up here to take a look at it, currently bore controlled and has uh, not under current attack, and that there are less, there are two or less hexes between it and the one we're attacking. So if we look at the slopes, it's under bore control. We're not attacking it, and there's only there's two intervening hexes, so the slopes can support. The, our, their, our attack on can, the enemy, the boar forces, the slopes, can support the defenders at O'Neill's farm. Likewise, the ridge, and likewise, Nincuelo Plateau. These three positions are going to support our, their, the defenders at O'Neill's farm. So we're going to have to draw three counters for 
the defenders here at O'Neill's farm. The next one here says minus one counter for each overlapping assault. That would be if we had two assaults going relatively within the same time as each other, but we're only launching one assault, so that doesn't apply. So let's see what happens here. Generally, we're going to pick these and we just take the strength that are on them. However, there are two counters we don't want to see. We don't want to see a crack counter and we don't want to see General Smith. Those significantly add to the strength of the Boer forces. Let's see what we get for the first one here. This is Heidel 2 and it is, we turn it over, it is not a crack counter. That's good for us because two strength is actually relatively weak. So that's a good pick for us right now. Let's see what we get. Kind of just randomly picking out of that bowl. Our second one here is Heidel 3. It is, we turn it over, it's not crack. So we get this one is a three strength. So good, so far we've only got five strength. We've drawn pretty well. We don't want Smith and we don't want the crack unit. Those things are pretty nasty. Let's see what we get for the third one. Second Pretoria, ah, we flip it over, that is crack. So we're gonna pull in from the cold stream objective. I'm gonna pull that up here and show you. We're gonna slide up here. The cold stream objective has this crack unit in it and they have shown up. This is not good for us because they are a five strength unit, which is going to significantly increase the strength of the defenders here. So we put that, the crack one here that we pulled over, we throw that one back and we replace it with the crack unit here. And that actually, in this case, the rules say this counts as one of those three counters. So now we have, we've gone through and we've we determined the three counters are there and we're gonna determine their strength, which gives them a strength of 10. That crack counter is not good for us there. All right, so we've moved on now to the fifth card. This is Assemble Night Assault Tactical Column. So it's daytime, doesn't apply to us. Number six is Night Assault Commando Strength Segment, but it's not a Night Assault, so that doesn't apply to us. So now, card number seven says basically it's the board deployment. If it's an isolated segment, you return a lot of the counters back to the cups. And what that means, it says if these patrol or smith counters are the only ones there without these Veld Cornet Scop, these Veld Cornet Scop are the units with attack strengths and defense strengths on them, these kind of strength units points on them. Uh, if we had something like this, which is a patrol here, and it's got not crack or anything like that, and it's just a little patrol deployment, they would leave and go back. But that doesn't apply to us because we have other counters here of full strength, and we didn't draw any patrols anyway. So that's just a little thing that could happen if we happen to be fortunate enough to have very weak defenders there. Let's go now to start our bombardment segment. So we could... Um, we're going to optional set up on the battle board is what it says to do now. So we actually are going to go do that um, and then we're going to adjust the bombardment markers but we don't have any of that and deduct shells and rockets. But we don't have anything there uh, because we don't, we're not doing any bombardment. But we will go over now and set up on the battle board just so we can see this battle a little bit more easily than seeing it stacked up here on the tactical board. So we've moved over to the battle board now, and this is basically a board that allows us to help calculate battles more quickly. Um, sometimes I use this for complicated ones, and we'll just use it now because it's easier to see everything. There are basically five rows here, if you would. And before we do that, there's probably a step back moment about what we're trying, what we're trying to do with this assault. The outcome of the assault is, is broken down into three different categories. If the total attack power that we've got, if the total strength of our attack is less than the total strength of the Boer forces, so less than one to one ratio, then we are routed. That's really bad. We don't want that to happen. Two, if it's one to one or above, but not two to one, then there's a 50-50 chance we lose or we win, depending upon a die roll. If it's two to one or greater, we automatically win. So what we're trying to do is to end up this process with twice as many strength points as the Boer forces that are here. Now, again, depending upon which ones we picked, some of the formations win and some, some kind of different modifiers, this is easier, either easy, more easily said than done, but we're, that's kind of what we're going to be doing as we're work through, working through this process. But let's start now taking a look at the no bores segment. So number nine says, if there are no bores now present in an objective, the bores are overrun, return the bombardment markers to their boxes. But that doesn't apply to us because there are bores here, these three units that we have to deal with. And again, these five columns here, the five rows here. Veld Cornet Scops are the names of these units with strength. Patrols would be the units that don't have any strength attached to them, but there's none that showed up for us. Cold Steel is kind of a desperate move that we can do to try to turn a negative outcome in our favor. 
Um, the firepower is where basically the infantry companies at the start here that are all coming into the attack. And we have to commit these to the attack, so they are all part of the attack. Then any reserves, we can decide if we want to commit them as things go along. They go in this reserves row here. So we are all set to execute this battle, and the first thing that we need to do now is to determine, calculate, and record the Veldskornet cap firepower on the firepower track. Step one is to add up any firepower on these counters here. We've got 10. Okay, now let's go through the modifiers that we've got. The first one is plus four if Smit, if General Smit is here with his commando. He is not. He didn't show up. We didn't pick him from the cup, so that doesn't add that plus four. You can see why if General Smit's here, that's a problem, because he doesn't count as one of these counters, and he's got a strength of four, so that could have completely altered the battle if he were present at this defensive position. Now, it would be plus three if our companies were in mass formation. But remember, we rolled that six, so we're in extended formation, which means they are not. So the next dice roll modifier is Boars Crowning the Heights, which is a plus one modifier. There are certain objectives in the game, like the Neck and Table Mountain, that if the defenders are in, it, in them, they're considered to be at high altitude, and that would add a plus one to their defensive strength. O'Neill's Farm is not one of these locations, so that modifier doesn't apply. Let's take a look at the next one. Minus three modifier if companies are in extended formation. And we are, because you recall, we recalled, again, we rolled that six as we were kind of determining what our formation was. And the 360th headquarters gave us a plus one die roll modifier on that, which means that we are in extended formation. So the boar combat strength goes from a 10, which is these counters here, down to a seven. What's really interesting about this, and you can see how the disadvantage to having Kali here because Kali gives a plus, a, a minus one modifier to that formation roll. So there's a 50% chance you're in a mass formation with Kali. There's only a one in six chance we're in a mass formation with this headquarter unit. And there's a 50% chance we're in an extended formation. And the difference between a seven for defensive strength and a 13 for defensive strength, because we're trying to get to that two to one ratio in order to guarantee our victory, so that's a six combat differential right there. That would have required us to have 12 more combat factors. So you can see how some of these little things start to play out in big ways as you get into these different, uh, the battle resolution circumstances. And we did have, again, to our disadvantage, they had a crack unit here, but they could have had Smit, which would have made it stronger. Now, another thing we could have done is we could have taken Kali with us and brought more infantry companies because we could have merged those two companies into one column if we brought General Kali, but then we would have been consuming more ammunition. So all of these little decisions kind of play out in these fascinating ways, I think, with this different battle resolution circumstances. So let's take a look at some of the other bombardment markers. Uh, none of these apply because we are not bombarding. Uh, we would have been minus two for a field gun section or minus two for a mountain gun section in Majuba Mountain. So there's some other specifics here for some rockets and things like that. But none of these apply to us because we have no uh, bombardment capabilities in this. So step 11 is the cease bombardment segment, but we're not bombarding, so we don't return any bombardment counters to their spots. The Boar Outpost Consolidation segment is if the defenders were in an outpost, but they're not. They're in a farm. If they were, we would have made this die roll to see if they had Sangers built or not, but that does not apply to us because we're attacking a farm. Uh, the next step is to calculate the British firepower segment, but there's one thing I want to show you before we do this. One of the things that helps us calculate the battles here, there's a firepower track here, which we use to calculate the strength, just so you remember it and you don't forget it. So we have the boar firepower here was at 10, but then it was reduced down to seven because of this die roll modifier. So just to make a note, on this opera, on the tactical board at the top, there's a firepower strength calculator, and you just put this in here. So we're just gonna remember that the boar strength was seven. Now let's go back and calculate the British strength. So let's work through the steps here on the British firepower. First of all, we don't calculate the reserves, so we're just calculating the infantry, the company strength here to start that, and that is a 15. So we're gonna go back up to our firepower track and we're going to make note that there's 15 uh, firepower strength there. And then we're going to deduct the cartridges because each one of these companies uses one, uh, one unit of ammunition, if you would. So we gotta take those out as well. All right, so the initial British firepower strength is 15, which right now is uh, at two to one, so that's good. We do have five units, so we have to reduce our ammunition from 
13 down to 8. So we'll just kind of readjust these here a little bit. Put that back there. That 10's unit goes in the 1's. So we've burned through 5 units of ammunition. And our combat strength is 15 to 7, which is good. But there are some modifiers to look at. All right, so let's work through some of these modifiers now. Plus 1 if Wood commands the tactical column. That's General Wood, but he's not here yet. Minus 1 if we had companies of different regiments firing, but we don't. We just have the 360th here. If Kali were here and we had brought additional infantry companies, that uh, that would have, had a, would have applied. Minus one if there are any patrol units in the commandos, but there aren't. They drew no patrol units to come here. Minus two if companies are firing during a night assault. That doesn't apply. Minus one if boars are behind Sangers, but they aren't. Aha! Minus two if boars are in a farm. So that one does apply to us. And then minus three if boars are in trenches. Those are at the, the harder positions, the main position. So that doesn't apply to us here. So let's go back and make that adjustment on our firepower track. So the British firepower now was at 15 and it falls to 13. So it's 13 to 7. We are below 2 to 1 right now, which is not good. All right? So we've made our initial calculations here on the firepower segment. Let's go to the next card. This is where the reserves come in handy. So commit any reserves. And if we had Gatling guns and stuff like that, we would have to uh, kind of adjust for them. We're also going to have to deduct cartridges, the ammunition, and case shot. Case shot, by the way, is the type of ammunition that field guns and mountain guns use if they're in an attack like this. If you're bombarding with them, you would use shells. But when they're in an attack like this, they burn through case shot. So now we're going to, uh, basically we're at 13 to 7 and we want to get to 2 to 1. So we need uh, 14 or more. So what we're going to do is we're just going to commit one of these cavalry units. It doesn't matter which one. We're just going to bring this up and commit it into the battle. Now this is a regular cavalry unit coming up. This will now give us, get us back up to 15 firepower, which is more than 2 to 1 over the defenders, which is where we want to be. So let's go calculate that on the firepower track and subtract that additional cartridge. So on the firepower track, British firepower strength goes back to 15. And we're down to 7 ammunition. So we've burned through a pretty good amount of ammunition here. But now we've reached 15 to 7, which gives us our 2 to 1 result, which is what we were looking for. So our next step is the firepower quotient segment. Divide the British firepower by the Boer firepower to calculate the quotient, ignoring any remainders. We're at 15 to 7, so it is greater than 2 to 1, so our quotient is 2. Now we can go up to the firepower board, the firepower track, and reduce those to 0, because we no longer need those once we've got our quotient. But I'll just do that off camera. So we know that our firepower quotient is 2, which is good. Because here we can see the different results. If our quotient were zero, because we're cutting off any remainders, we would have been routed and our units would have taken two hits, which would send them to the hospital and that is bad. If the quotient were one, then we roll a die roll. On a one to three, we'd retreat. On a four to six, the boars fall back. So a 50% chance that we would have been victorious, but we would have suffered casualties, one step losses on the units that we've committed had we reached that result. But by having a quotient of two or greater, so odds of two to one or more, the boars are overrun and we suffer no hits. Which is, this is, so this is good. And we would have the result here, a cold steel table, which is a separate calculation. We could basically commit some more units into kind of an aggressive attack if we had gotten this one to three Re British retreat result on a die roll, but uh, that doesn't apply in this case, so we won't explore that one at the moment. So we are victorious, and the boars have been overrun. Right, so this is our casualty segments. We have no casualties because we had that quotient of two or greater. And here's an interesting side thing too. If General Colley uh, were present at this battle, and we then we would roll a die roll here, uh, and if he had led a cold steel charge, it would have had a plus one modifier. And a result of six or greater means he's dead. Now, the first two times I've played the game, that happened in the very first week. I lost General Colley in both cases, which actually creates some complications because of his, his ability to ferry troops back and forth. So that, to me, seems like that's another reason why we don't necessarily want to commit him to a battle unless we absolutely have to, especially earlier in the game. So this is British routed or retreat segment. This does not apply because we won, we were victorious, so we'll skip over that one. Now, here we go, step 19, we're almost to the end of this. Boars overrun or fallback segment. Remove any Sangers marker, so there aren't any there. Uh, return the commandos to the laggers, so that the laggers is basically their, that cup there thing. 
Okay, so if no British now present in the rifle fire hex, we would go to the uh, tactical card 20, but there are. So we're going to go down to the next one here. It says advance the tactical column into the objective. Adjust the objective marker to show British controlled. So let's do that. So here is our massive British column. We're, uh, we're going to move them into the hex, but we're going to show British control. And because this hasn't yet been secured, I'm just doing my little mnemonic to tip it sideways so that I remember that it's British controlled, but not British secured, which is different. We're going to leave our orders markers behind and everybody into O'Neill's farm. We have successfully gained control of O'Neill's farm. We've reached one of our, our remaining nine objectives is now under our control. Now, if this were an outpost that we had uh, captured, there's a role to see if the British uh, forces build Sangers, but this is a farm, not an outpost, so this part doesn't apply. But basically, you can see how, I mean, this is just as kind of a side moment. You know, it's a fairly, there's, there's some intricacy here, right? And the thing is, as you do it five, six, seven, eight times, it starts to get much faster. We're obviously going very slowly now to kind of explain things and work through them. But there's a lot of subtleties to the strategies here and a lot of different ways that the decisions you make impact the outcome of a battle. And there's a lot of variety to these different outposts, which is good. It creates a little bit of complexity in digging into the game because you kind of have to remember a little bit of the edge cases. But I think it creates a lot of the fun and the challenge to the game because there's a lot of different way, ways to approach this kind of tactical puzzle, if you would. So let's go to our last card, which is card number 20 of the tactical phase. Uh, it says, if it's a night assault completed, return orders marker to its box, but it's not a night assault. If there's more assaults, if we had a second assault, we would go back to tactical card 8 and calculate that assault. But um, it's not, so that's it. Now we're going to return orders markers. So this is the orders marker. It's going to go back to its box on the side of the board there and then return the tactical time marker to the start box. But uh, we never used the tactical time marker because we only had one column attacking. So now we're going to go back. We're done with our tactical phase here. We're going to go back to our operational deck and it basically gives us direction. It says go back to operational card six. Alrighty, so we're back up on our operational board and we finished card five. We're going to go down to day six here. Record assaults segment. If any assaults carried out this operational phase, place the British assault marker in the same box as the strategic time marker. Let's so up here on the strategic board, we have this assaults marker and we want to move this to point to this first turn. Uh, and that, this is important because this is a diplomatic, it's going to give us advantages because we're pressing the advantage and we're being aggressive in the British war aims, which is good for our political situation. And there's places where we have negative die roll modifiers if this assault marker isn't in the, the current week or in the previous week. If it's in either of those two places, we get the benefits of having kind of, of being in an aggressive mode, if you would. So this indicates in the game uh, gameplay that we are kind of pushing the advantage or at least pushing the offensive against the Boer forces. So card number seven for us now is the morning operational movement segment. Um, we don't have any operational columns, so this one doesn't apply to us. We would have had to have formed those columns earlier in the day, so we can't do this even if we wanted to at this point. Card number eight is the event segment, so we're going to roll on the event table. Now, in the first two times we rolled this, it was a plus one modifier because we had no assault at Lang's Neck. Lang's Neck is basically a reference to the whole tactical board, that area. But now that we've got that assault, we just move the marker, this plus one die roll modifier doesn't apply to us. So instead of needing a five or a six for an event, we only need a six. And given that events are largely negative, you can see the benefit for us, one of the benefits for us now is that it's less likely that one of these more likely than not negative events is going to occur because we've been pressing the offensive in the war. But let's make this roll, hoping not for a six, a three. So there's no event this, no event today. Just for the sake of this, let's walk through this ambush segment and talk about a couple things because I think it's a little bit helpful for learning uh, some more features about the game. So there are two places that there could be an ambush in this turn. Uh, we've got now gained control of O'Neill's farm, so an ambush could happen there. And also there could be an ambush at the British camp. So let's first take a look at whether an ambush could happen at the British camp. In order to need this, the card here mentions we need an eight plus on a single die roll. And this is for also for the British camp or a farm. So we can calculate both of these at the same time. Now, one of the things you know that if there's one of the die roll modifiers would be a plus one if there's no British assault at Lang's Neck. But we just did an assault at Lang's Neck. So again here, 
the fact that we've conducted an offensive operation this week means that it's going to be less likely that our troops are going to get ambushed. We've put the Boer forces on the defensive. It would be plus one for each Boer victory, but the Boers have won nothing yet, so that modifier doesn't apply. It's plus one if the ox wagon is in the convoy in an operational column, but we don't have an operational column and we don't have a convoy in it, so we're not calculating that one. Now, the minus one modifiers here, I think, are particularly strong. It's minus one per mounted troop in an objective or minus one per mounted troop in an, an operational column. We currently have, I think it's three cavalry, four cavalry, three cavalry up at O'Neill's farm. So it's a single die roll modifier with a minus three applied to it. The highest we can get then for these positions is a, is a three. So we can't, there's no chance at all that there's gonna be an ambush at the farm. The British camp right now has no cavalry in it. So that minus three die roll modifier for mounted troops don't, doesn't apply there. But still, it would need an eight, and the highest we can get without these die roll modifiers is a six. So as you can see right now, there's no chance this early in the war that the Boer forces can ambush either one of the two positions that we've controlled. And this is where it kind of gets in, because as we go on the defensive, and as the Boers start to have victories, then you can see how these elements could start to add up. If the, we had lost a couple times to the board, now we've got a plus two modifier. If we don't have cavalry in the position, things can get ugly kind of fast as you start losing uh, battles and as things start to go sideways here. But fortunately for us, early enough in the war, and we've conducted our assault, that uh, none of these things apply to us. There's zero chance of an ambush, so we're not going to roll for that. So we're back on the tactical board here, and uh, cards number 10 and 11 in the operational phase don't apply to us. They were for operational movement and for bombarding some of the, uh, the loggers' positions up to the north of the tactical board, which we can't do so uh, this early in the war. So uh, we are at card number 12, which is the secure objective segment. Now, we mentioned earlier on that there's, a, there's two types of British control over one of, the, of these objectives. You can control it, and then a higher degree of control is when you've secured it. And so this is the segment where you check to see if you've secured anything. Right now I've mentioned that I've got the British camp, I've got these uh, sideways to indicate that we've got control of them but we haven't secured them. One of the things that we could get close to pretty soon is the British camp because we've taken now O'Neill's farm. But we have to go over and look at the British secure objectives table to see if, if um, our British camp has been secured. To do that, we would need Majuba Slopes, Lang's Farm, and O'Neill's Farm. So in addition to this position that we've captured, we need to get two other positions in order for this British camp to be secure. So long story short, we've secured nothing. We control two objectives, but we haven't secured any of them. So we don't do anything in this segment. So next up is a transfer segment. So we can transfer any generals, regimental headquarters, companies, and reserves among these positions that we get got control up here on the tactical board. This is a good chance for us to reorganize our uh, positions. Uh, and if we did abandon a position, we would remove any Sanger's markers and adjust the objects, objective marker. But we're, of course, right now, we're not going to object, uh, kind of abandon any position. We do note here, however, that one of the things we're trying to prevent is an ambush on our positions. So we wanna kinda of think about that. But right now, because we only control one objective, I'm not too worried about that. So let's just kinda of think for a second, and then I'm gonna make some adjustments here to our formations. I'm gonna adjust our forces a little bit here. I'm gonna bring up uh, one of the infantry companies from the 58th Regiment up here. Uh, and the reason I wanna do that is I like the bonus that this headquarters, the 360th headquarters gives on assaults, that plus one to shift us into an extended formation I think can be something we can use in a subsequent assault. So I want to bring back the 360th to the British camp. We're going to bring up one infantry company from the 58th up here. And I want to get a couple of these field guns in position here so that we can potentially bombard the ridge in our next attack. We probably won't do this this week because I don't want to deplete our ammunition that much, but that's kind of the general thinking behind it. So into O'Neill's farm comes the 58th Infantry Company and our two field guns, the N5 and the 10-7. Everything else is going back down to the British camp. And with that, we come to operational card number 14, which is the next day segment. If it were Sunday, we would uh, go to the card number 15 and continue on with the end of the week, but it's not. It's Wednesday, so that means we go back to card number one. Originally, I was thinking to do two of these episodes, but I want to create one more, which you can check out here once it's ready, to finish up the week and to talk, take a look at the strategic turn. In the meantime, 
you could if you like this episode, you might want to check out our Men of Iron Battle of Agincourt series. We'll see you in our next episode, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.